So I'm from Boston, so I speak very loudly, very fastly, so we got about 15 minutes. Give me about seven. I'll run right through this. And so guys, guys in the first row, beware, okay? I can't see either, okay? So uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Meredith, for, for inviting me. Um, and just a couple of, uh, uh, of call-outs for folks here. My staff back here, Pilar and Steven and Harvey from the Historic Preservation Division, they work on buildings throughout the state on your behalf, and they're some of the most tireless workers here in the state of New Mexico, and I want to thank them for their work, okay? So thank you, guys. <laughs> and all the others from the DCA here that, uh, that work with us to make preservation possible. Uh, it's very, of course, as you know, as New Mexicans, your heritage, your history is very, very important. I come from Boston, where, of course, our history is all over the United States. Of course, history is the foundation and the roots of who we are. It's part of our identity as a people and how committed we are to save buildings like this, a 400-year-old structure that speaks to not only the past, but, of course, for the present and how we think about our place and, of course, the future. So today, what I want to talk about um, is, well, when I talk to Meredith about this, I'm thinking action and creativity and historian, they just, you know, they're... It doesn't quite, I don't know, I, but at any rate, <laughs> what she wanted me to do was to give you a little bit of myself and a little bit of my career and how I came to this place and how that trajectory, that arc um, over the last literally the 25 years of working in history and historic preservation has impacted and influenced the way that I think about these kinds of resources. And so what you're going to get today is a quick snapshot of those, really those change points in my life that made me think very critically about who I am, what I would like to do in my career, and how I want to affect and how I want to serve a community like this, and excuse me, and other communities that I've served since starting this. Now go back to the front page. A reluctant preservationist. I don't know how many of you in the same boat, but I wasn't born an historian. I didn't wake up one day when I was five or six years old and mom and dad came to me and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I had no idea. And even through college and even through parts of graduate school, I was still thinking about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. It wasn't until much later in my life that I decided that I wanted to focus and commit to this kind of work. So I truly am a reluctant preservationist, maybe more formed now, but we'll see where it goes from here. Now, this notion of creative mornings, I think, is a wonderful idea. It really is a breakfast lecture series for the creative economy. And when I was thinking of the creative community, when I was thinking about me and how I think of creativity in my job and in my life, I think of you know, Einstein's you know, favorite quote. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but creativity is intelligence having fun. And that was one thing that I learned when I was back in my 20s, that if you're not having fun doing this work, because all of the challenges that we face, the political issues that we have to face, the financial issues that we have to face, ideological, philosophical, historical, you name it. If you're not having fun doing this work, OK, if your creativity isn't bound to that, to fun, enjoying your, your career, enjoying your place, then what's the point? And that was the first decision that I had to make as a preservationist? Am I having fun? Is the work that I'm going to embark upon going to be sustainable? And ultimately, I think yes is the answer. Now, a wonderful quote taken from another Creative Mornings conversation says, um, that's what creativity is, assaulting uncertainty on a daily basis. So have fun while you're assaulting others, right? <laughs> Whether it be museum directors, OK, OK, or DCA secretaries or governors, what have you. It is a friendly assault, OK? But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship, OK, that's fostered in love and commitment, OK, to make these kinds of projects happen. And then action, of course, which is really the thesis of today, right? The condition or state of doing something to achieve an aim or an effect. So that really is what, so I had to think about these words. And I had to think about my career. And I had to think about where and at what point in my career did I satisfy all of these different requirements. Well, it began here. 
I began my career as an historian, as a ranger with the National Park Service. And I began in Yosemite National Park as a seasonal ranger, but I soon left Yosemite, this was in 1992, and I went to Washington, D.C. in 1993 to take a permanent career position with the National Park Service as what we call an interpreter. And I was stationed on the National Mall. At the time, there were only four monuments there. Now, of course, it's grown proportionally to our history. But then it was the Jefferson, the Lincoln, the Washington, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So the rangers that were at the mall were responsible for telling stories and narratives about our nation's past, linking it, of course, to the persons that these monuments represented. Now, the first challenge that I faced, if you remember this, this is back in 1993, 1994, which then would propel me to another place in my academic career, was the Sally Hemming Jefferson controversy. It was an early morning. It was a beautiful day on the mall. And if you know where the, Washington, the, the Jefferson is, it's right there at the tidal basin. It's quite beautiful. The ranges are stationed inside of the memorial. And I was approached by an African-American couple and asked a very important question. Why isn't the National Park Service interpreting that story? And I didn't have any answer. I didn't know what to say. At the time, literature was coming out, of course. There was DNA evidence linking Jefferson, of course, to Hemming and to the entire family. And the controversy at the time is that the Hemming family was making an argument in court okay, that because they were Jefferson ancestors, that they should have all rights to the Jefferson family. That includes being buried at Monticello. Very important historical moment for me, not having an answer not knowing what to say. I was representing the federal government. I had the flat cop on. I was at the nation's capital. And I was not prepared to answer one of the most basic historical questions of our time. And of course, this comes out of the 1960s and 1970s from area studies talking about African American history and then American Indian history, which eventually I went into. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. But the friends that I would make along the way, if you'd ever watched uh, Ken Burns' series on the America's National Parks, this, this ranger here was very prominent in the first two segments. His name is Shelton Johnson. And I'll talk about Shelton in a few, in a few moments. Books and things that I like to sort of throw up here uh, about slavery and about uh, African American history, how we're negotiating it right now, of course. Race, of course, is still a very important issue for our time and some of the archaeology issues. So let's. So historic preservation. As I began to transition out of Washington, D.C. with that particular conundrum, that particular challenge, and how I needed to respond to that as a person, as an intellectual, someone working for the federal government, right, I started going into and looking into preservation issues. It's about finding balance between competing interests. For me, action is understood as the fight, political and historical, to save what remains of our material past and its stories. When I, left Yosem when I left the National Mall in 1994, I went back to Yosemite as a ranger where I started to confront some other important historic narratives. Manzanar, Japanese internment, what was going on there at the time. The National Park Service had just purchased that land in 1986, which is on the east side of the Sierra. What to do about interpreting Japanese American history at that particular site? Again, we're new to this. The Park Service is new to these, what we call, sites of conscience. But again, these kinds of experiences, that how do we link the story to the material evidence that is there at Manzanar, which is very little? How do you make that story come alive? Right? Historically, the first site ever preserved and interpreted within the United States. And of course, what we had confronted, of course, with the saving of Mount Vernon in 1850 was the subsequent Civil War, the immigration story, all of these competing interests that had to be addressed and would be addressed in the 20th century. How are we going to interpret, let's say, Antietam, which, of course, one fateful day in 1862 became the bloodiest day in American warfare. Over 27,000 Americans lost their lives in one day at Antietam. How do you put that in perspective? How do you take the material culture of that park, which of course would be folded into the National Park Service by 1935, to tell that story? How do you tell it? Now, right now, the state of New Mexico is contemplating the Manhattan Project National Park Interpretive Plan. How are we going to tell that story? Okay. So again, this is a, an Alfred Beard study of Yosemite. It kind of transitions me back to the park. I would leave Washington, DC, and go back to Yosemite. Next slide. Ah, paradise, my paradise. 20 years, you know, hanging out. Um, climbing, well, 
the Mount Tanai, if you're, if you're familiar with the high country in Yosemite, that's, of course, stately pleasure, an important climbing place in the park, Tanaya Lake. Of course, Cathedral Peak, John Muir's favorite. He called it his cathedral, his church in the wilderness. And these are the places where we lived, right? But indeed, at that point, I kind of put things on hold a little bit. Ambitions unknown still, even though I was challenged by these other narratives. Life as a seasonal range in Yosemite, at least at 27 years old, was an unequal partnership, right? The park was doing all the giving, and I was doing all the taking. And that's exactly right. But yet, I was still confronted. I was still curious. I was still engaged with my experiences going back to Washington. How then could I understand this place, right, and be challenged by it? Well, I started to read, started looking into it, started to prepare actually for a doctorate in American history. I was specifically going to study American Indian history and environmental history because my experience is Yosemite to give me the framework in order to understand this vast place. It's the only way that I could have understood what was happening in this park. Now, the historical arc of national parks going back to the time that it was established in 1916 with the Civilian Corps, the historical arc of parks, of course, has absolutely paral paralleled the current conversation about climate change and technology. We are moving away from celebrating our material culture in our national parks, and we're using our parks now to understand these more important biological processes that are happening all around us. Places like Yosemite, we become part of that conversation to the detriment of the things that I wanted to study which were its buildings and its people, its social and its cultural history. Another challenge. So how do I use my creativity at that point to engage that particular narrative in a way right, that would make it, let's say, come alive and, and be revealed beyond some of the more important narratives of our time? And don't get me wrong, these are essential, right? Bill Tweed talking about climate change. Richard Louv talking about kids that don't go to wilderness areas anymore. and What's that doing to our relationship to what wilderness? Richard West Sellers, a Santa Fe native, talking about the preservation of nature in national parks. Again, all part of trying to answer these contemporary issues. And technology, Brewson's great book. Politics of preservation. This was I was first part. Now, part of a major federal institution and bureaucracy. The next step, of course, is just not to understand the intellectual aspects of the parks as sort of nice stories. What's my next? What's my thesis? My doctoral dissertation? But it's to handle the politics in federal institutions, trying to reveal these histories when you have to deal with all of these competing interests. And just recently, in fact, I talked to Rob Bishop. Um, at a meeting in Salt Lake City. He's a conservative uh, representative in the northern part of Utah, where Dinosaur National Park is right now. How do you then balance the competing energy interests of the state of Utah, and of course here in New Mexico, along with the preservation of these very important sites? Now, going back to Yosemite, this is the conundrum. And I had no idea this was happening in 1995. To the detriment of the cultural resources, which are immense, if you think about the rustic design that were founded here, not Yellowstone, at Yosemite. I want to make that point. Because, all right. But the incredible cultural resources that are in our high countries and our national parks, okay? How do you protect these knowing that the arc, that swing, is beginning to move away from talking about our cultural history to protecting our natural environment? So what do you do with these kinds of buildings? This is when I first started thinking about preservation. Now, the last building that I actually worked on physically as a preservationist was this one right here. And you can see the tails here, all white and primed. Right? I worked on that building for four years. This is the Tioga Pass Ranger Station on the east entrance of Yosemite National Park. It was built in 1931 by a California Conservation Commission team of kids, designed, however, by a very important National Park Service architect. Now again, the issues in Yosemite, is it a cultural or is it a natural park? What are these parks going to tell us about our contemporary culture? Now, however, though, the mission statement of the National Park Service right, verbatim is this, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects. Even though our culture and our society and our politics is moving the conversation to natural resource management, it's still incumbent upon the National Park Service to protect its cultural resources. So this is my leverage. This was my way in. Okay to take care of some of these wonderful structures. This is the Macaulay Cabin. This is actually Fred, Fred Eisler and his wife there in, in the 1950s. This is actually in Tuolumne Meadows. This is the ranger station in Tuolumne that was built by a civilian conser conservation corps team back in 1934. This is a, if you're familiar with 
Um, the high country, this is the Parsons Lodge, which was built in 1915. It's currently now a National Historic Landmark. These are masonry buildings. These are large pole pine. They're also covered by 550 inches of snow a year. So think about that as a preservation. What are the preservation, you know, real, what are the real issues with preserving these buildings, okay? Now, the range of light, right? Just to give you a clip glimpse into some of the cultural histories that took place there. A very important meeting between John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt took place there in 1903. The park does not interpret the story. Why? Some of the most important aspects of its history. This is where conservation and the notion really was fused between the great conservation president and the great natural history writer of our time. 1903, John Muir, young days at the University of Wisconsin when he studied botany. This was in 1860, 1861. And of course, this is Ranger Camp up in Tuolumne Meadows where the rangers live for a series of six or seven months out of the year. And of course, the John Muir Trail, if you're familiar. Where I live was the confluence of the, of the John Muir Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail right there at Tuolumne Meadows. So you have those cultural features as well. Large linear features, trail systems, ranger stations, right? The rangers that lived here since the 1920s. It's just incredible, just bursting from the seams with history. So living there now, engaging in the community over the next five to six years, I started to sort of invest in this place to create what I would call a sense of history. Because before you can actually go in and look at this project here, right, you have to be utterly committed to it. But you have to invest yourself in the energy that it takes to understand the place. So Carl Sharsmith, uh, 91 years old, the oldest ranger uh, in the National Park Service, lived next to me. I had this incredible resource. He came to the park in 1930. He had earned his PhD at the University of California at Berkeley. He was a botanist and came for three or four months out of the year to study botany. And this was just one of the most serendipitous relationships that I've ever had. So now I have a gentleman right, that has seen the entire history of the park, invested in its resource. I'm there looking at the culture. Right? But I'm also challenged by the park as it's moving its sort of political focus away from culture to natural resource management. Great books that speak to these themes. David Glassberg's book, A Sense of History. Martha Narcunas' great book, The Politics of Public Memory. Action Intellectual. So now I'm ready. I'm done. I'm ready. I'm invested. I've been there for about eight or nine years. I had started a doctoral program. I didn't know quite what to do. So I decided to go back in time to try to find a moment, OK, where the park hadn't invested in its narrative and take the next four or five years of my life and write a doctoral dissertation on a moment in Yosemite history that would link what I would call these action intellectuals with the material culture that these people basically sort of occupied over the next 20 years. Yosemite, in 1920, started the first nature guiding program in the national park system one year before Yellowstone. These are our modern day interpreters. What I loved about these guys, okay, this is actually Dr. Harold Bryant, this is Dr. Lowy H. Miller, and Enid Michael, the first female ranger in Yosemite, was part of a triage of rangers that began teaching people nature values. So there I was, trying to figure a way to combine both my love of nature, the wilderness, but right in a cultural context. Now, the buildings that they would occupy, this is where we staged our interpretive programming. Stephen Mather, the first director of the National Park Service, had bequeathed to the park in 1920 the first ranger club where the ranger naturalist had lived. Now, again, in 1995, these buildings were being basically neglected because of the larger natural issues that the park was facing. But if I could somehow find a way to link a narrative, a story, to that moment in time back in the 1920s when we began this nature guiding program to the material culture itself, it became much more likely for me to find funding from the park to preserve these structures. Go back to, I'm sorry, go back, Mary. Just so that you know, this is the original museum in Yosemite. It was built in 1924 on the west side of the valley, just below Yosemite Falls. This, of course, is the the lookout at, uh, uh, at uh, Glacier, oh, oh God, I'm losing my mind here. Well, at any rate, Ranger Club, the Lacant Memorial, which celebrates the life of Joseph Lacant, who had came there in 1870 um, to basically offer a summer program for students from Berkeley. Uh, 
Now, this just opened up all kinds of possibilities. Once I was able to write the document and to engage in the literature and to engage in some scholarship, to put these people in context, then I was able to make arguments with the preservation shop to identify all those buildings that were utilized by those interpreters. Tioga Pass, here, the entrance stations, the old rustic designs, and of course, rangers that were linked to the story, and that's me actually shoveling snow, uh, <laughs> opening up the high country camps. And then it just stonewalled. So at that point, once we had a foundation, let's say a good, into sort of good, let's say, historical narrative, I then joined the preservation shop as a, someone who actually was going to go and start doing the preservation work. We began work on the historic bridges in Yosemite. Of course, this was going all along. Inside the Lakot Memorials, looking at the barns, and this is the shop team right here in 19, uh, 2007, 2008, and 2009. And then it just opened up all kinds of possibilities. So at that point, once I had invested, once I had been in a place for a series of time, invested the scholarship to understand the place, I began to expand beyond Yosemite to understand some of the other narratives that were important to the park, but not yet interpreted by the park. The old High Sierra roads that link the mining communities to the east to Bodie State Park currently. Right? All the CCC camps that were in Yosemite in the 1930s that the park had not invested any time in understanding or, another, or interpreting for that matter, and then identifying the physical and the material evidence to support that narrative. Bodie State Park, of course, very important to the Yosemite history. And of course, Dana Meadows here up in the high country. This is a very important story. This became the high country cross, essentially, from the Eastern Sierra over to the Western Sierra, where the Paiute and Mono on the Eastern Sierra used to trade for goods and services. This is literally an open archaeological site. It's also the home of a, two or three generations of Basque sheep herders. Now, the park had never interpreted those stories because it wasn't really part of that 20th century national park narrative. So this then opened up all kinds of interesting possibilities. Now, to link it back to DCA and this building, once you've invested a certain amount of time in a place, and once you've become part and partial with it, and once you've, I think, has created a narrative and stories to link the material past to the peoples that lived there, right? What happens to, let's say, the, the, the value of authentic? It was absolutely imperative in Yosemite at that point that we commit to preserving those buildings as they were in the 1930s and 1940s as a representative sample of the people that lived and worked in those spaces. Because otherwise, whose story is it? It becomes our story. If we begin to manipulate buildings like the palace to reflect, let's say, preservation values of the day, okay, and we, you know, we're entitled to do that, without thinking of the people who occupied these buildings during their periods of significance, Right? The building becomes ours, and it should become ours, but the building also needs to reflect those persons that made these structures significant in the first place. One of the lessons I learned in Yosemite. Now, despite its significance, we're constantly competing for shrinking public dollars. Okay? So all of you here, I suspect, have a very important relationship to the Palace of the Governors or other historic buildings here in New Mexico or throughout the city. Right? So, we can't rest on our laurels. What I learned as a preservationist, reluctantly at first, and then moving into it as a professional, is that we have to be engaged. You have to be curious about these places, and you have to engage the people that can make these, these projects possible. Okay? That includes the legislature, that includes museum professionals, that includes everyone. So, so that, that is my inspirational talk. I did in 30 minutes, and that is it. So thank you very much. Yeah.